Hey everyone on Chris's Patreon. It is another episode of Drunk Lesvic. That's right. I'm Tara Scott, Chris's <laughs> podcast partner from Queerly Recommended. She asked me to come back and be the sober adult in the room hurting the drunk cats, aka trying to moderate a panel between two drunk lesvic authors. Mm -hmm. So of course Chris is here as it is her Patreon account. Um, but with her this week is Tegan Shepard, awesome author from Bella Books. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Yay. So we're going to actually start by helping people see how to make the perfect martini. Mm -hmm. Does somebody want to first explain why we're doing that? Sure, yeah. I um, First of all, I love a drink, uh, which is why I'm on Drunk History, uh, or Drunk Lesbic. It's going to be Every Drunk time. History. <laughs> Anything can happen. Exactly. <laughs> I'll probably talk about history. I'm a big history buff. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things I wanted to do was just talk about like how cocktails are awesome. Uh, because like, you know, they kind of get a bad rap these days. Everybody wants to drink hard seltzer. So, uh, so I just kind of wanted to, uh, to do a little info sesh on, uh, on the martini. Because um, I think a lot of times, I think a martini is a great like, all around drink or all around cocktail, like a great mm -hmm. entry level. Um, but a lot of people have had bad martinis and that's generally because you don't know what type of martini you like. Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk about the different types of martinis. So I'm gonna do a little demo here for you. Um, great thing about martinis is they're super easy. It's three ingredients. Uh, you've got your first booze. Uh, I use gin, you could do gin or vodka, wow. but uh, spoiler alert, uh, Gin is just vodka that is filtered through yummy stuff, uh, usually juniper <laughs> and some other spices and stuff to uh, give it a little more flavor. Um, so I use aviation gin. Uh, that is Ryan Reynolds gin, and he is an ally and a gentleman. Oh. Um, yes. So I like aviation. Has some bitter notes to it, uh, kind of nice. Um, so there's that. Uh, second ingredient is vermouth. Uh, you want to use extra dry vermouth. Um, doesn't matter what kind, they all taste alike actually, um, except for the sweet kind, which is red and makes a really weird martini. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so the, the first like kind of difference about the martini that you'll find is you've probably heard people say dry martini um, and dry versus wet uh, is how much vermouth you put in. Um, so the classic martini is a dry martini, um, like the kind of post-war uh, area, that's when they liked really dry martinis. Like there's this Winston Churchill quote, see history, told you history. history. <laughs> uh, there's this uh, great Winston Churchill quote that is the perfect martini is to pour chilled gin into a glass and wave an unopened bottle of vermouth above it and then drink the gin. <laughs> so, which is just gin, which is delicious, but not necessarily martini. Uh, so a dry martini is doing one half part vermouth to three parts gin. Um, yeah. How did, I mean, I, I, I think we know the shaken stirred preference of James Bond, but the wet dry, what was James Bond's wet dry preference? Uh, he never specified. And if you don't specify in a bar, <clears throat> you're gonna get a dry martini. Okay. Um, so that, that'll, be, that'll be the difference. I would just like you. to say that I'm being very, calm and not talking about the wet aspect of this conversation <laughs> i'm oh. leaving it alone <laughs> are you, you just wait you just wait there is because spoiler alert i do like it wet uh <laughs> <laughs> um so wet Thank martini you. is one part vermouth to three parts gin uh and vermouth is kind of like nutty and delicious so the more the merrier right okay um and then the last ingredient is your garnish. Uh, we've all seen that Andrew Kendrick movie, right? With uh, lemon twist uh, in, a, in a martini. You can do that. You can do any type of citrus. Mm -hmm. uh, the aviation gin, in interestingly, because it's bitter, actually works with a grapefruit twist. Um, so oh. go do something crazy. Mm -hmm. I like the classic olive. Uh, and this is the other thing I like uh, is a dirty martini. So if you're following along, I like it wet and dirty. Um, <laughs> <Who doesn't? laughs> so, exactly uh, so dirty martini is adding 
equal parts vermouth to olive juice. Um, so if you have it dry, that's half part. <laughs> I saw that face chair. <laughs> it's really good. I mean, I don't like, like olives. Salty. So, oh, so okay. the idea of putting, I, if I don't like olives, I can't imagine that I would like all juice in it either. It's, it's like, really what, good. what if we put pickle juice in too? It's like, no. Ooh, no. No, that could be yummy. No, no it's some, it can't name be. it something different. No, uh, no, no. Um, I'm for the olive. I'm all for yes, the olive. Yes, olive. And see, that's the other great thing about a dirty martini. In the standard martini, you get one olive. In the dirty, you get three. So... That's exciting. That's a meal. Baby. I did not know that. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some places will give you more than three. It depends on how much you flirt with the bartender, honestly. Uh, so How many do you have in yours? How many do you have? I have three. Like 12. Oh, you have three? <laughs> you really have? Did you have like a bunch more or did I just like see? Like No, no, no. Uh, well, I mean, like I will probably end up getting more as the night goes on. Okay. Uh, Cause okay. I do enjoy a snack with my drink. Uh, <laughs> and see, that's the other thing. You don't have to eat the peanuts at the bar if you have a dirty martini. That's true. Um, but yeah, so that's your three ingredients. And then here's the important thing. Look, I love James Bond as much as any girl who has 007 tattooed on her bicep. Uh, <laughs> but the whole shake and stirred thing, he is totes wrong about that. Oh. Uh, and, for science, right? So, okay, when you shake a martini in your shaker full of ice, if you shake it, then you aerosolize your alcohol, which is great for some cocktails. Like if you have an egg white in there, you really want that. Uh, if you have uh, gin and vermouth, however, it has kind of a velvety mouthfeel. It's like the difference between like fat-free milk and, and whole milk on your tongue. So okay. you want to keep that velvety mouthfeel. So you stir. You do not take. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, okay. Because you don't want a, a frothy martini. You want a, a velvety, wet, and dirty. See, I'm, I, these are like words I would use in my book. Exactly. My book. Exactly. Velvety, dirty. <laughs> velvety, wet, and dirty. Oh, uh, nice. that's, that's perfect. perfect. So life. that for me is the perfect martini velvety, wet, and dirty. So, but how long did it take you to make your martini? It took a while because I had to measure out all the, mm -hmm. you know, six shots or five shots of stuff and skewer the olives. That's the hard part, right? Trying to catch those olives mm -hmm. with the bamboo yeah. stick. So you got to do that while yeah. you're sober. So you don't stab yeah, right. yourself. And so you can exactly. actually measure. Exactly. Exactly. All right. There's a lot of spillage involved. Well, so you got to like measure for future martinis <laughs> we'll have later on in the evening. Right. So exactly. Just, uh, throw them just in your glass. So I have an easier and a, I almost want to say better method uh, for making. I know. I'm so sorry. I know. So clutching uh, my pearls. Woohoo! Ah, I cheater. Look at that. The Bartesian. So my friend Fiona Riley um, and her wife got this for me for my birthday. So it's super easy. I just put the glass underneath and then I pick my strength which in this case, I'm going to pick strong. That okay. a girl. Mm -hmm. Because that's how I roll. Mm -hmm. So it's going to make the me the perfect martini right now. And I've got my glass ready. Happen. With the, the lemon, lemon wedge yeah, and everything? This, yes, this is a lemon drop martini. There are several available. And it just comes in a little capsule. And I just put the capsule in and it's just, it's got like the, the stuff in it and the alcohol comes from the Bartesian and cheers, my friend, because here cheers. is my martini. <laughs> Yummy. Excellent. Your demonstration was much shorter than mine. <laughs> it was. <laughs> well, you it, included the history of the martini though. That's true. I, did. I just basically said easy peasy. There it is. I slipped in a Churchill quote and everything. I mean. <laughs> you did. You came prepared. I just <laughs> like. There it is. This is my third of the evening. This will hopefully maybe be my final because my um, last drunk last pick was uh, quite an experience that evening <laughs> after the camera stopped rolling. <laughs> <laughs> you hit stop and then just face planted into <laughs> Basically, yeah. I, I'm the one that I can't sleep if I've had alcohol. I'm that person. So I stay awake forever. Do you have to work tomorrow or? Is I do. Awesome. <laughs> I, I call, here's the deal. So I already sent an email and said I was going to be late. So I gave myself a couple extra hours in the morning. 
It's just planning. See, uh, I don't know what day you're posting this, but in Canada tomorrow, it is a national holiday. So oh, nice. I should probably be the one who's drinking, but this is much more fun. I was about to say, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you can't drink with us because we need a responsible adult, like you said. I also don't drink, but I mean, you also, uh, I don't drink. I'm a cannabis person. That's true. That is true. But, well, see, I, I mean, can't for my job, so. Sorry, what? Have our, uh, for my job, I can't, but we all have our vices, you know? That's true. We do. And for me, it's like, I have been at the same job for 22 years and they don't drug test or anything. <laughs> they don't, they don't. So, I mean, I, mean I, I work in tech, so I mean, they don't test anything <laughs> i feel like you would be weird if you didn't smoke cannabis <laughs> yeah, yeah that's one of those like you're not allowed to do it during the day but it's like i know people that eat bottles of booze in their desk like there used to be oh shit what was it called there's a thing on fridays oh it was called dev beer and it was like this th- it was a system where you would like buy in and every, it was somebody's turn every Friday to bring in however much beer. And that was, yeah, anyway, that tech, yeah. right? My, yeah, that my sounds great. whole entire work, everybody has a little refrigerator in their office because we all have offices. And we have, it's, it's in the shape of a big L and every single one of us has an office. And we have a little refrigerator in our office and, and most people have like little, those little bottles of wine and they drink <sighs> It's the weirdest thing. Like it's so it's so cool. Yeah. I think it's on the job. But we're actually here to talk about books. <laughs> we are. Books. <laughs> yes. We both have books coming out in June. So first of all, congratulations on your new Thank book. You. This is very Thank exciting. Um, so first I'm going to introduce Tegan's book, which is called Swipe. Right. Uh, and if you're all looking for a book to go out and pre-order, definitely go and get your little pre-order finger ready because it is going to be ready and available widely on June 22nd. Uh, I have no idea when it's going to be available on the Bella Books website, but before that, because uh, Bella and Bold Strokes both do uh, that thing where it's available a couple of weeks ahead of time. Right. And the blurb says... Kieran Hall has never been lucky in love. She married her high school sweetheart only to have him leave when she came out as a pansexual. What a dick. That's for me. That's not in the blurb. <laughs> Did say, they changed my blurb. <laughs> I sent in an edit. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to editorial. <laughs> uh, then there was the relationship that turned serious. It wasn't long before they were out the door too. For mm-hmm. years, Karen avoided any attempts at finding the next person to break her heart, building a life that was comfortable but lonely. Mm-hmm. That loneliness finally pushes her to give dating another shot. The only problem is, without freshman homeroom or a chance meeting in a bar, she doesn't know how to meet someone new. With the help of her best friend Penelope, Karen takes the plunge into the intimidating world of dating apps. It's just as bad as she knew it would be, but <laughs> Penn is always there to pick her up and dust her off after another disaster. In fact, hanging out with Penn quickly becomes her main motivation to keep swiping right. When one of her dates suggests that maybe her dating problems stem from her feelings for her best friend, it leads Kieran to wonder, could love have been right there in front of her all along? And we're going to do this pretty similar to how the dr- last drunk lesbic went. Chris, what did you yes. think about this book? Well, uh, first of all, I love the premise. I love dating apps. I mean, I don't love dating apps, but I mean, it's, I think it's great because first of all, I looked for the app Swingle. I did. I went to the app store and I looked it up. I was like, yeah, okay. So um, I thought it was a really, I I think it's a great way to uh, draw people in because the older crowd that has been like with their partners for 20 plus years who are going to read this book are going to see what it's like, you know, what the dating world is like today. Um, whereas people who are new and upcoming, they can follow along with the progress of the, of the, uh, the main character because they've been through something very similar. And I think that's, I thought it was so clever. I mean, it was so interesting to me, you know, just to see, okay, so let's look at a dating app. What does a dating app look like? And then, you know, so I, you hear about it. You hear like Tinder and all those uh, different apps, swipe right, swipe right. That's hard to say. 
three times fast. So <laughs> just so y'all know, you that's only hard said to it, say. You only said it twice. <laughs> twice, twice. There we go. Three times. So, um, so first of all, I I really I love this book. This book. See, I already did it. Swipe <laughs> book. I love this book. Because, book. <laughs> book. Um, I love this book because it wasn't just a story about somebody trying to find um, their perfect mate, their perfect match. It was, it was so much more. And I wasn't expecting that. I mean, I kind of, you know, Tegan and I kind of talked about this and it was just like, Hey, I'll read your book. You read mine and we'll do it. We'll do a drunk love pick. And I'm like, perfect. Sure. You know, because I know she's a good writer. Uh, she's won awards. So I'm like, sure, let's do this. And so I went into this book, not expecting anything other than just a surface story of just like two people trying to get together person going through really bad horrific dates and maybe some good ones along the way um so i i just i absolutely love your writing it has a finesse that a lot of writers don't have and so i really enjoyed myself it's a very smooth read very very smooth you. you're welcome and and the characters um we have just like the, the main character is kieran and yeah she's she, i feel so sorry for her she has had a shitty life like really bad I felt bad for her the whole time you know um and then her best friend which when I first read the name uh Penelope I was like Penelope what so is this is in 1800s you know I'm like what what are we doing like where did this name come from Penelope you know we don't know this name and so but then Tegan had shortened it to Pen, and it was so brilliant I'm like Pen, that's a great name you know and just and it fit her character perfectly and, and I was really surprised that this book had so much depth because um, there, the character Penn has a syndrome called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS. And you so, yeah. thank you. First try. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna kind of read what this is. It's, it says EDS affects connective tissue, primarily the skin joints and blood vessel walls. Symptoms include overly flexible joints that can dislocate and skin that's translucent, elastic, and bruises easily. In some cases, there may be dilation and even rupture of major blood vessels. So I had no idea that, that this existed. And so, you know, one of the main characters in the book has this symptom. Is that what Evie Otley has, the drag queen? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and that, that was kind of neat because I wrote, so I wrote the first draft uh, right before that season because it was last mm -hmm. season, not the one that just ended, but the one before, I think. Season. No, I'm behind. Jada so. Essence Hall, it was the one before that. So it would have been season 11. Okay, yeah. But yes, it is. It is what uh, she has. Um, yeah, because uh, because uh, and, and there was a great scene in that season of RuPaul's Drag Race where uh, Evie like I think she like rolled her ankle or something during oh. mm -hmm. uh, during the, a dance number and that happens all the time to folks with EDS. It's like it's a very it's one of those things where you have to constantly think about how you're moving your body. So like those of us who are able bodied, it's like it's really difficult to wrap your mind around that. I think sometimes it's like the, the constant awareness of your body. Yeah. I think if you want to, if I, I didn't even connect it until Chris read the description, but I think if you want to learn about it, I had never heard about it before then. Um, and I really appreciated how she shared that aspect of her story and got really vulnerable about it. Um, but also used it almost as a superpower like there were just mm. in some of the dancing um there were days where it was like you could tell that she was pushing herself to do things that were going to take it out of her but nobody else could possibly do that because their body could move that way but then you know later on it, talking about how um like in some ways her skin on her face like i'm 41 and so my face is like here you can see it's kind of doing this thing because I'm getting older and that's just yeah. what my skin's doing. Um, and her skin's doing that in her early twenties. And she's talking about how like, I need to do as much drag as I can right now while people are willing to pay to come and see me. Um, mm -hmm. And I found that really, really interesting and compelling which is not what your book is about. Let's get back to your book, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me, it's time to herd the cats back. Um, <laughs> so so taking this, this actually, you wrote this book on a personal level. So it would be great if you could share the story of why you wrote this 
pers- this mm-hmm. why you wrote Penelope's character and 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 the history behind it. Yeah, so uh, so I have this friend Renee, um, and she is awesome, and I've known her for years. Um, and we uh, like so. My, I have a friend Bobby who has like a, a Mardi Gras party every year, and Renee came. Renee used to be Bobby's roommate, and then he got married, and you know. Uh, so Renee came and she was wearing these ring splints. And if you have never seen these, it's basically, it just, from this side, it looks like a really thin band here and a really thin band here, but on the back side, it crosses right at the joint. So the reason, and and I was just like, Hey, those are really gorgeous rings. Cause she had them on every finger. Um, and she was like, yeah, yeah, that's a medical device. They're not rings. Cause it keeps her when she types, oh, okay. uh, it keeps her hands from over uh, from hyper uh, extending. Um, and so that's when I found out she had EDS. Like I'd known her for years um, and didn't know. Cause it's one of those like kind of silent chronic illnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and like Renee is super awesome. Like she is one of the coolest cats I know. Um, but she's had a lot of trouble dating because mm-hmm. she will go on the apps and she'll go out on a date. And like, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you know, at what point do you tell somebody, hey, I've got this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so she had all this trouble dating because nobody wants to date somebody with a chronic illness or a disability because, you know, it's just people get scared. And right. I, in a way, I can understand that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, take a chance. So okay. I, I wanted her to be able to read a book where someone who, who looked like her and had her life was the hot one. You know what I mean? Like, like uh, you know, I think that's a, kind of a lot of the reasons that, that we write WLW fiction, right? This is why we write romance with star- starring queer women is like to, so that we can see ourselves right. as sexy and desirable and lovable. Um, and that was, you know, I, I had kind of this story banging around in my head and then, uh, you know, I, she talked about that and I was like, this is, this can be a chance where I can like make my friend feel good about herself, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, that was, that was one of the reasons that I, that I made Penelope the way that she is, you know, she's like Shane with EDS, Shane from L Word with EDS (laughs) is how I describe her in my head. And their, their friendship is fantastic. I mean, I loved just, it was so smooth. Like, and I love, I have friends like that. Like, and it's mm-hmm. so hard to actually write that kind of smoothness in a relationship on the page. It's really hard to get the dialogue to smooth, you know, from one character to another and just snap, 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 snap without any effort. And I feel like you nailed it with these two characters. I think you did a Thank really you. good job. Yeah, that was one thing I really wanted to show is like that kind of teasing end of a friendship mm-hmm. is where like, you know, I think sometimes like folks use that as a way to like, you know, like a, to kind of like cover up their feelings in a way sometimes, or like to, to distance themselves. And I think that's what Penelope was doing. It's like that, you know, get close, but not too close. Um, so I was, I was trying to show that and I'm glad that it came through. Yeah, it did. It, you did a very good job. I, I really enjoyed their relationship. I feel like Tara wants to say something. No, I was just wondering, has your friend read the book? Um, So I uh, interviewed her ahead of time um, because, you know, I think it's important if we're writing outside of our, our niche um, uh, to, to make sure that we have a a better understanding of, uh, you know, the folks that we're writing. And then um, I asked her to sensitivity read after I got uh, the draft. So she, uh, she read it pretty much like it is now. Um, But uh, yeah. I'm sending her a copy when I get mine. So we'll see how she, what she thinks. <laughs> um, she'll yeah. love it. And I love the dedication. That was sweet. Oh, so, thank you. I, yeah, I think, I, yeah, like I said, I, I was really expecting it just to be kind of a surface romance, which I love. You know, I love the whole escapism and, and romance, especially contemporary romance. And I was, uh, I was surprised that it had a, diff, a different a depth to it. You know, I mean, not, not a surprise for you, but I'm just saying it's just, I wasn't expecting it because I went into this book not knowing anything. I didn't read the blurb or anything. I was just like, okay, send it. We'll read it. And I just went into it and I was like, wow, this has a lot of different layers to it. So it was really impressive. Yeah. And, and I have a ton of quotes because this is what I do. I love to, to awesome. you know, Sarah knows this about me, yeah. but I love quotes. 
So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six quotes. And it's kind of, I, I like it because Karen is very, she's almost, you know, as much as she wants love, she almost fights it, you know, and she always finds like the, the I don't know that she's a negative person. She just like, she will find something negative to say why she shouldn't go on a next date with this person or, you know, maybe there, and some of them have been horrible without a doubt. I'm not going to like gloss over some of these people, but she kind of has a negative attitude, even though she wants to find love. I think she's so quick to go to the negative because she's not had good luck. Mm-hmm. So this was, I thought this was great. This is kind of a long quote, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, things like that never happened in real life. Sparks didn't fly when gazes met. Eyes never lingered in that certain way. Hearts never beat together. No one walked into a room and saw someone they already knew and realized with a single look that their feelings had been love all along. It was a dream distilled and distributed by Hollywood to hold people as a perfect mix of happiness and sad so they keep buying tickets. Movies were nothing more than legal heroin and we were all junkies desperate for another fix. Totally true. That is so true. true. Yes totally true so I love that line and, and it was funny because um I went through the whole book you know and then about halfway through I was like you know I really need to start like highlighting all the really good quotes that I loved about this book and it was one of those where it ended up being more highlights than it did <laughs> not so um but let's okay and here's something I laughed out loud it takes a lot for me to laugh out loud in a book that I'm reading and I'm all by myself there's nobody around for me to actually like guffaw or like you know, make a <laughs> down it takes a lot and so um and this this one line made it so karen is texting pen and she's waiting for her help when somebody reaches out for her on the app swingle and this one line made me laugh because it's so true and she's like approximately one year passed while i watched the three little dots flash on screen because <laughs> that's so true it's like you're waiting for a reply you have sent a text that could either make or break something whether it's a relationship or something and she's waiting for pen to get back to her on this um because she's like she wants pen to help her uh write this response back to somebody she's interested in swingle and, and those so three true. dots are like the oh worst oh my god right? they are the worst <laughs> Because think about how many times in your life those three dots have meant something, you know, whether it's catastrophic or, you know, or just like life changing. Truly, the three dots are like assholes, but they're yeah. also like the best things ever. You don't know what's going to happen. And they're just, it's like, you're, st- you are so focused on three dots in your life nowadays. It's just yeah. so weird. It's and it's so like, weird. they'll go away and they'll come back and they'll go oh, away and they'll the come worst. back. And you're like, oh. <laughs> I'm going to write what you need to write. <laughs> But like you said, at least you know you're not being left on red. So like right. it's happening, maybe? I don't maybe, know. maybe it's not. Awesome. And then like and then they disappear and you're like, fuck, what did they read it? To? Wow. Yeah, that's the worst. So texting has really improved and also also have has worsened communication throughout the years. Or like yeah. the last five or ten years or whatever, however long texting's been about. How long has texting been here? How long has it been? I mean, the little dot, the little dots haven't been here that as long. The, the little dots are, I feel very Apple centric. Are they on Android mm. things or I don't even know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm an Apple. I mean, I'm Apple phone, but everything else is not, but for sure. Same. Phone. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not a fan of Apple, but like, ooh, those phones, they, they keep me coming back. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, have a tether to my phone like I if it's not near me I'm like I panic where's my phone it's the first thing it's like it's not like how's my dog it's where's my phone <laughs> well, exactly <laughs> literally last night Neil said you know what's the great well, you know what's the great thing about Chris I'm like tell me he's like she answers every email within five minutes because <laughs> <laughs> it is right there and I'm like message email. I was like yeah that's true she does right away if she doesn't she's probably asleep <laughs> yeah it's right there and like and it's so funny because I I think so even when I'm writing my phone is there like some people shut off everything and they write but I'm like I'm watching tv I'm texting with people I'm messaging with people I, it, the phone is with me at all times because that is my link to everything especially you know since the whole pandemic happened you know I need that connection more than ever and like to see like a text not to get answered or you see that they've read it and they moved on and you're like really yeah that's the <laughs> worst how dare you it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, uh, okay, so back to the quotes. Um, yeah, so that was, 
love that. That literally made me laugh out loud. I read that line approximately one year past. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Um, okay. Uh, my hand slid over hers as it had a thousand times before, but this time it felt completely new. A pulse of electricity ran from the soft velvety skin of her hands from my fingertips and straight to my heart. I knew she felt it too. That's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. Um, let's see here. What else? Um, oh, and then as quickly as it had, had arrived, her hand moved away, but the ghost of her, of her touch haunted me far longer. How true is that? How true is it when you first like start dating or like you're kind of interested in somebody and they touch you just even if it's just like just like, like a brush of a touch like I will hone in on that and I will focus in on that because it's I can still feel it you right so I think I'm, you, a, I'm a very tactile person yes, so like yes yeah so I mean I I tend to be like like not I'm gonna say touchy feely but I feel like that has inappropriate connotations it's not that <laughs> like I, just, I get like, it. I'm the kind of person who, like, if you're my friend, I'm going to, like, touch your shoulder or something, right. you know, like, that kind of thing, so, like, yeah, that. Yeah, so I, I need that, too, and so I really resonated with this book and all the emotions and then the physicalness of it. I think that that's, you know, and I understand how consent is so important in writing Lesbic now, but I think that, you know, everything about this book, there was nothing ever off, you know, I didn't feel off on this at all. I felt like consent was there, and I felt like the, the love as a friend, and then, you know, Yes, I don't want to give anything away, but I mean, the love was there. So uh, yeah, it was a very enjoyable book. I really did enjoy it. And I hope it wins a tons of awards. Tons Thank of you. Them. Hope so too. I'm, I'm very proud of this one. This one is like, yeah. so I did a lot of firsts on this. Like I, I don't usually write in first person. Yes, beautiful, um, good job. Congratulations. I love first person. Thank you. Yeah, We're, and see, we, we both, cause like, so you wrote it, uh, I mean, this, uh, jumping ahead to not guilty a little bit but like so yours is first person present right. which was like very odd for me because I don't read a lot of first person present and and but so so back to like why I wrote first in this um I have always read third person books like it's just I don't know if that's I haven't read a ton of romance until I started writing romance <laughs> Mm -hmm. um and I feel it feel like in a lot of like other genres third person is more the way that it goes mm -hmm. um so and I have a friend uh, EJ Noyce uh who writes mm -hmm. in like all first person and she was talking about how hard it was she was trying to write in third and I was like mm, no, <laughs> you're wrong so I was like I'm gonna try and write a <laughs> book in first person to see because it's gonna be stupid and then I wrote and it was like Oh, I loved it. I loved how close I got to be mm -hmm. to Kieran. Um, I love how close it felt like the audience could be. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a really short like attention span. So I will write a book and then I'll put it aside for six months. And when I read it again, I'm like, who wrote this? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so when I came back to it, I was like, I like, sometimes it's hard when you, when you step away from a book for a while, when you come back to it, to like get back into those characters to remember who they are. Cause there's a lot of people in my head, right? When you're a writer, there's a lot of people in your head. Yeah. Uh, but it was like easy to dive back into her because of the first person. So I wrote this book to like prove that first person wasn't everything that everybody says it is. And then it was. Yeah, it is. Annoying. <laughs> I converted it. I'm so Gen X and like Woo! I just like I do things out of spite and then they turn out perfect and I'm like fuck. <laughs> yes, uh, for sure. I mean, having written both third and first person present and first person past, uh, there's a reason why people write in those POVs. It, there's a, a reason, and and I feel like sometimes I nail it and sometimes I don't, and so. So we'll get to, we'll talk about a first person present here in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like I think that's a good segue, right? The right time. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> the switch to well, except it's not Chris Bryant. It's, it's Brett Ryder. Ryder. Right. Brett Ryder. That's right. Brett Ryder, See, I has, <laughs> Brett Ryder has entered the chat. Well, yeah. Wait a minute. Chris Bryant's leaving. 
<laughs> okay, here's Brit Ryder. Hi, hello. You have like a mustache or a hat or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. What do I have? I have nothing. I can't even guide myself. A Dang different it. color drink? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so Chris Bryant's new Brit Ryder book, the follow-up to Shameless, is called yes. Not Guilty. It is coming out. The wide release is on June 15th, I mm-hmm. believe. Uh, I think that one's out on the Bold Strokes site on the first. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Hooray! I actually know when the Bold Strokes release. <laughs> I don't know. Good job. Yeah. Anyway, it's a thing. <laughs> <Good job. laughs> but the blurb for that one is: glass ceilings, red tape, rules. Some things are meant to be broken. No one expects their heart will. Claire Weaver's only rule. Wait. I do know how to read. I am the sober. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> However, we're going to make the font a touch bigger. There we go. Yes. Hey. Right? Look at, look at that. It's that thigh, right? Can we just talk about that thigh? Yes. Oh, great cover. It's great. I am. Okay, I'm going to try that again. Claire Weaver's <laughs> only goal is to climb the ladder of success. After winning an unwinnable toxic tort case and securing a $90 million verdict, she's a shoe in for a judgeship at Kansas City Circuit Court. The last person fire investigator Emery Pearson expects to see in court is the stranger she had the pleasure of dominating last night. Only this time, Judge Claire Weaver is definitely in charge. To say she's excited is an understatement. Claire is everything she needs. Sexy, available, and not looking for a relationship. Their day jobs clash, even as their desire burns, and a discreet sex-only arrangement is the only option. But when pushing their sexual limits threatens the boundary of their hearts, mm. will they be guilty of breaking their own rules or allow love to tip the scales? Aiden, mm. what did you think about the museum sex? I mean, the oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, museum sex. Oh, and mm, so many other. Oh, I don't want to get into too many spoilers, but boy, do you like writing public sex? I'm fine with that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, oh, I love, so I don't read a lot of erotica and, uh, okay, I don't read a lot of long form erotica. I tend to go like fanfic or like novella, which is why Shameless was great. Um, but it was really, really great to see uh, the difference because I've read a couple of your books that are romance novels to see the difference in uh, your romance versus your erotica. So that was really, really neat to see like a, a different side of you on that. Um, I mean, I love Emery, like who doesn't love Emery, right? Like just, (laughs) just like a super fun butch and like, who's a little soft centered. Like, I mean, she's a sweetheart. She's a sweetheart. Like, it's just, uh, it's great. Um, but so, okay. I have, I'm going to like straight up interview you here because I have some quotes, but I love (laughs) like questions. Um, so like I said, I read a couple of your romances and you write mostly romance, um, but this one is erotica. So I feel like there's a lot of like confusion and misconceptions uh, about erotica as a genre mm-hmm. and how it's different from romance. So I would love to hear from you, Britt Ryder. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, what does erotica mean to you? Like, how is it different from romance? Like, what do you love about it? And what do you wish everyone knew about erotica that they are wrong about now? Um, well, I don't know a lot about erotica. I've only read a handful, believe it or not. Um, but mm. I, I kind of felt like sexually on the page, I was really pushing it. I was really, you know, I wrote about sweet love, sweet sex. And then I thought, well, I'm gonna add a couple things because in real life, you know, people do add things to their sexual pleasure you know whether it's like toys so they introduce toys and that's really hard to to write in romance to make that sound romantic so I thought well I'm just going to go ahead and write erotica just to see like like if I could do it and, it and if it worked and and I just said well I can't write it under Chris Bryant because I people are used to me and the sweet romance you know sweet with heat I think is, is kind of like my label sweet with heat because you know I do I do tend to to write because in first person you think about sex differently than it is to describe it on the page in third person because you're in your own head or you're in the character's head so when you're writing things you know and I've said this before 
when you're having sex with somebody, you can think in your head, I want to fuck her. And that's what I'm going to do. But you can't really get away with saying it. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't depends on the situation. And you know, whether you're like, you know, animals or if it's a sweet moment, you know, you really can't get away with it. And you're like, Oh, I can't wait to taste you or touch you or something. That's what you say. But in your mind, you're thinking some something else. So I feel like with erotica, it's, it's more of an id person you know it's 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 more in your mind and it's it's sex without the emotion so that was kind of hard for me to write because I'm so used to writing emotion with my sex so it was hard to take the I had to go back through several times and take you know I can't say that because they don't have that connection yet they do but they don't want to admit it so I think I think that people think that erotica doesn't really have a plot they think it's just straight sex not straight sex but you know they just only (laughs) sex I'm not sure sex. No, they think it's just like sex. That's all it is. And it's really not. I mean, it's it's still a relationship and, and you're still building the relationship. And there's also in this in this case, I added more of a storyline to it as well that they were both involved in. So um, so I think that like I've had people who have read Shameless are just like horrified by it. They're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, they just like oh my the best. she says. She says cock too many times and, you know, dildos and strap-ons and it's like just completely offended. So in a way, I'm glad I created this whole persona of Brit Ryder because, you know, I mean, I, I need to kind of keep my sweet, happy people with the Chris Bryant versus the like, it's okay to go there, you know, with the Brit Ryder. So I, I feel like just, just give erotica a chance because a lot of it, you know, there is the opportunity for a storyline and a developing relationship, even though, you know, it's maybe not about the romance. It's about the hot and heavy sex that turns into romance. Yeah. That's what, so there's a, there's a quote that I feel like is kind of like a good way to show the difference between romance and erotica. So, um, so, okay. So this was Claire said, I can't stop thinking about her, not because I want something that isn't there, but because something's there that I don't want. And I just love that. Like, like sex is fun, right? Yeah. Like yeah, you sex is be fun it's, to have sex. I mean, sex is right. a fun thing, and and yeah, it's also so, a thing. You know, it's an activity. It's also a way to show somebody you love them or that you enjoy being with them. You know, it doesn't have to be love. It could just be a sharing experience. Exactly, and so that's what I have. Another like Claire said this about her sexuality. Um, she said, "Lust isn't something I'm ashamed of or proud of." It's something inside me that growls like hunger pains and something I need to feed. Today, I ate well. I, I love that quote. I love it so much just because, well, first of all, it's a beautiful turn of phrase, but like a lot of women don't embrace our sexuality, right? Like, a, like we're taught not to. We're taught to be ashamed of being turned on. Like there's so much um, that our lust is something to control and ignore um, and one of the reasons I like to, to read and write erotica, uh, is that it's, it's sex positive, right? Like, uh, especially like, um, so like I'm a lesbian and like, as a lesbian, I feel like a lot of times in the world at large, like our sexuality is co-opted by straight men as like a fetish. Right. And, you know, and so like, but just like queer women in general having sex, like, like I said, sex is fun. Like it feels good. And it's a way to grow intimacy with others. It's a way to grow intimacy with yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, Like just kind of understanding your own body. And like, I want all women to embrace their sexuality. Um, And I love that you showed a woman who doesn't shy away from that. That's one of the things I love most about Claire is that she really Mm -hmm. embraces that. She certainly knows her body and knows what she wants and uh, she is not shy about it. And that's the whole point about not guilty. You know, when I was coming up with the title, she's not guilty about her sexuality. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's like, she is not apologetic about anything. She's like, this is who I am. This is what I want. You know, uh, this, this night I'm going to have sex with this person. And this night I'm going to have sex with that person. And it's not wrong. And there's no shaming in it. And I feel like that, you know, not guilty kind of covers a lot you know, in her life. And for sure, definitely it's her, her sexuality. She's not guilty about it. I mean, she's like, she's all in. She's like, I don't care what you think about it. You know, and it's, it's funny because, you know, I'm kind of excited to see the reviews on this because she is so brazen about it, mm-hmm. you know, and I think we need more people. Like you said, sexual positive people. We need that. 
Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I like is that, that you can do, I think, in an erotic storyline versus a romance, like even while she's working out what's going on with her, like she has sex with other people. Like she's not, you know, she's not pining. And that's one of the things right. that I really, you know, romance, there's a lot of pining, which, which right. I dig, like I totally <laughs> dig. do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like humans, we, especially those of us who like are stuck in our head all the time, like, we pine a lot, but like, mm -hmm. But Claire's like, you know what? I'm just going to bang some random masseuse. Like, that's cool. Emery. Emery doesn't stay Emery doesn't right. the that's whole true. time either. It's true. Right. So so that's what, so I was talking to Chris about this before. Uh, so I hadn't read Shameless before I read oh. Not Guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got, if, if you've read Not Guilty, like I got to the dinner dinner scene <laughs> and I was like you know what maybe I should go back and read Shameless so I went and I bought Shameless and I read it and I am the perfect reader because I just kind of like sus suspend my disbelief really easily so I read Shameless and I'm like it's weird that this keeps happening to Emery that she just <laughs> walks into a museum and has the same script with people <laughs> and <then> I'm like <laughs> So I'm an idiot. It's okay. It's fine. Um, so like, and then in Shameless, like the uh, Claire leaves and Lily walks in, and I actually like, I, I was reading this in an airport waiting room, and I went, oh. right, <laughs> right, like, oh, yeah. that was Claire. Claire just like, oh, it was. I, um, I mean, and um, unfortunately, if anybody hasn't read read it. It's a bit of a spoiler, but also that has been out for what, like three years? Four years. Sorry, it's been three years. You've had time. Right? It's right. too late. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, I just think it's one of the best twists I've ever <laughs> read in anything. I still it's remember so it good. being holy. Sh like, you. It, yes, it's great. It's a it's a great erotica story. Whatever, fine. All the, who gives a shit? It's the twist. It's all about the twist. It's all about the twist. <laughs> like, it is. Yeah. All the rest of it is great. All the rest of it is executed so well. But like the twist is what hooks you and what kept me wondering about them for four years. Yeah. yeah. And getting to read, getting to finally see Claire's side was mm -hmm. so satisfying. Getting to know what Claire was thinking that whole time. Right. And how she ended up there was just like, sure, random person <laughs> with a strap on. And just like her friend saying, you know what, why don't you go to the museum? Maybe you'll bang someone. She's like, yeah, I'm going to go to the museum. <laughs> and then she does. And I'm like, shut your face. That's what? Like, All right. Oh. Oh. So, so here's what I found. Like, I found that writing as Brit writer, I come up with more twists and plots things because I don't, I'm a panster I don't I don't plot anything so like that was a surprise to even me and then I wrote a I wrote a short story in the uh the erotica travel series that BSB uh put out a couple years ago and it was pre it's a prequel to Shameless and so it's called Mistakes Happen and the same thing happened in that like I, I see I find that I write when I write as Brit writer there's more twists and turns in the stories than I have as Chris Bryant and I think it's a lot of fun. And so I have fun writing it. Well, that's what I find. Like my, uh, like some, the fanfic that I write tends to be a lot more like out there. Like it tends to be closer to erotica. And I feel like I'm more creative in that because you just kind of take, you take the shackles off, right? Like you just kind of, you know, it's, it's you don't kind give of like, a fuck. you don't, you give, don't a fuck. give a fuck. You just want to fuck. <laughs> Um, right. There's nothing wrong lot. with that. <laughs> okay. I know I'm supposed to be hurting the cats and now I'm hurting them away. But what <laughs> things do you write in? Uh, so, okay. So I have written several fan fic genres, but the only stuff I've published is on AO3, um, uh, Archive of Our Own, uh, mm -hmm. is Mass Effect uh, fanfic. I know. I know. Yeah, and I'm replaying right now. <laughs> right and and here's I was replaying here's, until six minutes before we started it, and yeah, I couldn't I shout to, like, to come and do this <gasps> so full-on paragon right mm -hmm. um I so uh I am coming to you live from the uh exotic <laughs> residence in Rochester New York mm -hmm. because I'm on a work trip but I left on a work trip on May 16th 
And for those of you who don't play Mass Effect, Legendary Edition came out on May 15th. So I left my <laughs> PlayStation behind. Oh no. Oh, uh, I like, Tragic. yeah. Tragic. Yeah. Have you read, oh shit. Now I'm trying to remember the name of the series. Okay, so Ray Magden has written- The eight. Best Entertainment. Yes. Yes, of course I have. Of course, yes. Yes, actually, so so I love- I, ne- so, I never would have put the two of them together, but like Tivos and Aria are the, they're the perfect. So, so I love Tivos and Aria so much that I, I wrote a whole, uh, a whole, um, it like, honestly, it was, ha- you just you edit this out for people who don't play video games. Um, you wrote about so- them? I wrote about them. You, send it to uh, me. you have my email address now. So, so it was it was called White, <gasps> White Knight of Omega. Was my uh, was my uh, it's it's not on Ao3 anymore, unfortunately, because I've turned it into I've kind of adapted it into uh, an original fiction. So mm-hmm. it's not on there anymore. Because mm-hmm. so anyone who doesn't play Mass Effect, Chris is just like checked out. I'm like I'm checking my email. <laughs> I'm checking Twitter. <laughs> I'm like go for it. So, so Aria, Aria is like a is a big part of Mass Effect, but Tivos only shows up if you make like one decision in game one. She shows up in game three, um, and Ray D. Magden, who writes some of like the best fan fiction out there. Well, she wrote uh, the Dixon Vic for sure for the series. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure, yeah. Like Mass Effect, like I just like she's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she wrote this the best entertainment. It's this character that like, and because Tivos doesn't even show up unless you make this one choice, you know, five years earlier, like it's just oh, it's so good. Anyway, well, we got it. We got ooh, it's, 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 a, it's a politician mm-hmm. okay. and, and a criminal and a criminal, but oh. like a gang leader and not even just gang but like think of like the head of the friggin mob not so like she's a little criminal it's like the head of the mob with like high level government official and like literally and all she wears crazy. is like a leather jacket and a corset like it's fucking <laughs> hot so oh killer yeah yeah, so so no I have I've turned my uh my Tivos Aria fanfic uh, into uh, a seven book series. Book one came out last year. Book two is out in 2022. What is this book? Wow. Uh, it's Queen of Humboldt. Oh. Uh, so so it kind of mixes my fanfic and my love of like 90s action movies. Like I was this <laughs> kid that like, like Terminator 1 was like the yes. best movie that ever happened. Mm. And like they're, it's stupid. Like, right. Like, like, like the, <laughs> the, the, the sex in those and like every, it's dumb. Mm-hmm. Like it would never happen and it's gross, but like when you're a nineties kid and like mm-hmm. uh anyway. So yeah, Predator. so uh okay. So so I have a I have a um uh female shepherd uh Ashley Williams long form fanfic still up on AO3. My handle is T Sheps. Feel free to look at it. Okay. See, I, anyway. I, I kill Ashley every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh really i hate uh Olenko. oh i fucking hate that guy uh, but she oh. was, she's a space racist <laughs> and she is a space racist oh that's problematic fuck okay. i should have thought about that for okay okay so when you uh when you replay if you Okay, Chris, I just had a yes, hi. We should, hey, we, should, hey. we, should back. we should have taken come back come come back. <laughs> Uh, I can leave and come back. It's all good. I can oh, take we should have out. We should podcast when she does her replay, and then we should talk about it. <laughs> oh, I, sure. I'm going to need like okay. So like the first the first time I did a playthrough Mass Effect. So I I came to it late because I had like a job in a bank, and so I didn't like have a real like a lot of time. <laughs> and then I got a, an overnight job. And anyway, the point is I had a lot of time to play games. I played Mass Effect one through three in like a like a six month span like 300 hours of gameplay, like all smooshed into one. Oh, so so I'm gonna need 300 hours to replay Legendary Edition. Okay, come back. So, uh, I'm back curious, with me in December. I'm curious 
to know if you have a similar experience that I do um, in that I find there are some things that are not aging the best. Some mm. things age fine, but it's like I'm far leftier in my politics now and some mm -hmm. things are making me cringe real hard. But did you- Is this the game talk? that we talked about in this upcoming episode? Yes. Is this it? Okay, okay. So now, I, now I'm on board. Now I get what's going on. Yes. I was lost is, there for a minute. This is that game. But okay. man, if you would be open to reading fanfic about aliens you've never heard of before, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, can, yeah. I can send you the file. You'll be like, who the fuck are these people that I'm reading about? Tara, why are you sending this to me? And I'd be like- oh Like, God. I'm not going to lie. Just read all of Ray's fanfic. You know- yeah. I, I wrote some Dragon Age stuff too, but like, I like also I could not compete with Ray's Dragon Age stuff. I, I love Bioware. I love oh, Ray's original so. pick is really good too. I don't know. If yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I've read a lot of Ray's stuff. Uh, I did a couple of in the last two. Yeah, the last two GCLS conferences, I did uh, fanfic uh, panels with her. We're gonna cut all of this out. Of <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, should I make another martini? Is that <laughs> That's up to you all. I'm sending you a file, and whoever wants to cut whatever out can do what they want. But uh, I don't know how to edit. So you we'll have, save. <laughs> did you have any other thoughts or questions for Chris? Oh, hey. Hi. Yes, I have more. I'm sorry. I have more. <laughs> sorry. Back to Chris. So, so Jacob, you just need to be on Queerly Recommended, apparently. This has to be a thing. Yeah. Like, I mean, I honestly, I have I almost bought a uh, a Switch just to play Hades because. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so yeah. hard not to. Yeah. I work uh, out. Chris, there's just going to be a Switch arriving at your house one day. I mean, I, I, have, know. To, I have to find out where you live first. <laughs> I mean, and I used to, so like, so my wife and I used to play a lot of Animal Crossing. And so like when pandemic hit, we work in the medical field. So we didn't lose our jobs. Like we were working 10 times as, you know, as much. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, all these people who are sitting at home, like on quarantine, talking about their Animal Crossing islands, like, oh, I want it so bad. Yeah. See, I didn't, I didn't lose my job either. Cause I work at a, uh, I work at a company that, um, facilitates donations through uh workplace giving programs and um it it turns out that when uh things go bad in the world people want to make donations to feel like they're doing something That's about good. it that um, makes me feel better about humans yeah it was um pretty incredible so we had a very good year so i did not lose my job and i did not have time to jump on animal crossing at the same time as everybody else i had to wait until shit slowed down <laughs> right uh, but all right we're gonna do it for QR. A little pause here. And then we're going to get back into Chris's book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can leave, really. <laughs> we're just going to geek out about games. I know. Games, you right? definitely need to be on the show for sure. For sure. Uh, uh, okay. So this is actually like an important thing about this book that I like, I really loved. And so I want to talk about and I want your feelings about. Okay. So uh i love so emery uh who is fucking hot like let's be honest like right firefighter uniform hot um but like do it let's be honest they both are well true. okay that's true and yeah way. yeah 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 <laughs> i do i do love a high femme my wife's not quite high femme but like sometimes which mm -hmm. is nice um anyway uh, so Emery, uh, like, so she prefers to have sex with a dildo, right? And she packs and she doesn't really like penetration, um, right. but she doesn't seem to be on like a gender discovery or gender transformational journey. Right. And I love that because, I mean, at least it doesn't happen on the page. So I don't know, like in the, in the book, she doesn't. So what I like about that is like, so like, just because a dildo is shaped like a dick doesn't mm -hmm. mean doesn't make it a dick, right? Right. Like it, so it, it's a sex toy. Wearing one doesn't make you want to be a man. And right. wanting to have sex with one doesn't mean that you want to have sex with a man. Um, so like the way that you have sex is not necessarily indicative of where you are on the gender spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious about like, like if that was intentional, if that's something that you were going for with her, because like that's a nuance that's often missed 
and right. conversation, even inside the queer community, honestly, it's that nuance that's missed. So talk about Emory. So uh, for Emory, I actually kind of, I actually interviewed a lot of people who are on the butch side of things, you know, just kind of like, you know, how they are, how they uh, express themselves sexually, what they like, what they don't like, you know, there are some that just don't like to be touched at all, you know, which I find really interesting. And then there are some that just are either scared of it or aren't comfortable with it and uh, who always have to be like the top. And so Emery is just trying to show that she is, while that's kind of been her preference as like a strong top, that she is also open to kind of like let go, you know, with Claire, because there is that, you know, she's starting that, that relationship and she's willing to let Claire do what she can, uh, what she's comfortable with. And I, I think there's that a lot of times people just assume that everybody's comfortable with everything sexually. And that's not true. You know, I mean, I think, you know, we're all old enough to where we've had maybe in our lifetimes, we've had partners that aren't comfortable with being touched a certain way. And I think that, that, that you have to respect that. And, and you have to know that just because you're in bed with somebody, there has to be consent and you have to know what they're comfortable with and you have to ask for it and ask them if they're comfortable for it or with it. And so, and I feel that that was, that was important to talk about. You know, I think you're right. A lot of people don't discuss it. They just assume that they're going to like it if you flip them over and, you know, do whatever. And, and that's not always true. So I, I tried to on the page, I tried to make it as real as possible when you're dealing with a new sex partner, you know, it's important to find out what their likes and dislikes are and, and to actually, you know, cover that in a way that's responsible yet sexy, you know? Um, yeah. Cause that's a, that's like, because we're in Claire's head, right. We mm-hmm. see her saying like, Oh, she doesn't know. I like it rough. Like, right. you know, like she has those moments where she has that clarity and she communicates it. And I think like, it's, it's nice kind of like, there are very clear ways that you can have consent. And I think that's important to show that, but also like once you get into it, like talking about what you like and what you don't like can be a difficult thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So like having that, like Emery is always asking, like, is this cool? And she stops sometimes. That's, that's a thing that I think is really great because she stops and says like, Oh, you moved a certain way. Does that mean this is not okay? Mm-hmm. and Claire is like no, no no this is okay I want you to do this you know like there's a, that communication during sex even if it's like a hookup even if it's someone you're never right. going to see again like that's such an important part of sex is like and and having a sex positive situation right is mm-hmm. like having that that conversation right and and I think that a lot of it a lot of less Vic doesn't really go there Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think it's important, especially, you know, now with, with all of the, the, I don't want to say, I don't want to call movement, but, um, the whole, let's, uh, let's have consent, let's show consent let's see what's sexy, what works, you know, Emery's not really, you know, she's not, how do I want to say this? She's not really about herself. She's not she doesn't really talk much about herself you know you don't really know like what she likes and what she doesn't like you don't know until you know Claire's side of the story comes on you just know that she's like a strong butch and so Claire's kind of like I don't know if she likes this or if this is if she's letting me do this one time or you know it's kind of interesting like and then that's how sex is you don't know what people are going to like right away you have to talk you have to communicate and and Mm -hmm. I think, you know, everything is so lovey-dovey on the pages. You know, I write romance, so I can say that, you know, it's like we make it perfect on the page and it's smooth and everybody loves everything that you do. And, and I think that in reality, we need to discuss that more, you know, what is considered sexy, what they like, what they don't like, like, uh, no, you know, it's one of those words, I don't like that, you know, and you should be able to, to stop your partner and say, I don't like that or continue on. I love this. I love what you're doing. Keep doing this. And that's where I think it's so crucial for it to actually become normalized in fiction. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I think I often, I I make this plug as often as I possibly can um, because I think a lot of authors don't necessarily um, consider it or don't feel like it's that sexy. Um, But I mean, it's for two types of readers. The first is, baby queers that they're going to be learning about sex right reading from these books um and who are often they're not going to be getting 
um, LGBTQ inclusive sex mm-hmm. ed. They're not going to be getting it at home. They're not going to be. So where are they going to learn this? Well, it's often going to be from fiction, if at all. Um, Mm -hmm. But then also how many adults never learned it in the first place? Right. How many adults never had the opportunity to learn that that's how that should be. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I love when there are books like this, Megan O'Brien has been fantastic about making it present in her Mm -hmm. books pretty Mm -hmm. consistently. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to see it happen more and more like I really would love to see more and then alongside that I would also love to see also just more um even if it's like questions about testing have you been tested recently Mm -hmm. Uh, have you like possibly barrier use depending on when and how it's appropriate but like again it's that idea of lesbians can get STIs too like don't think it's not possible like Mm -hmm. and if like I just think straight romance is light years ahead in Mm -hmm. showing that and Mm -hmm. I feel like our sector can do it too can absolutely and I get that there's this argument for well it's fantasy and it's like sure it is fantasy but, but also like, would you like to be a part of leading the charge? Right. Which authors would like to be a part of leading the way and changing it because the change is necessary and it's going to be, co- it's, it's going to come. Somebody's going to fill those shoes. Who wants mm-hmm. to do it? Well, and that's what, one of the moments that I like, and I like, it's, it's sort of along those lines, but like in, in not guilty, there's that scene in the museum. Right. And, uh, and Claire is going down on Emery and she takes the condom off and she says, I take the condom off because I don't like the taste of latex. And so right there, we're not talking about like biological to biological, but it's still like, Mm -hmm. it's normalizing putting a condom on the strap on because especially in that moment, like we know from, from shameless that Emery has sex with more than one person with that strap on. Yeah. That's an important thing of having a barrier there, um, you know, because because in Shameless, I think and and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that after she has sex with Claire, she puts a, a condom on before she has sex with Lily. I, I think that's right. It's been four think, years, but I think so. <laughs> but yeah, like <laughs> so, I just read it the other day. So like, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> but you're drunk. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> drunk. So, uh, but. But that's an important moment. And I just, so I, I made a read for another Bella author, Kate Gavin. Um, she just put out a book called Table for Two. Uh, and they have an STD talk in that. And one of the things I like about it is that it's not clear that um, whether both characters are lesbian versus bisexual, pansexual. Because this is the thing that can be difficult in those conversations about barriers and about STDs is like, if you're only asking your bi or pan partners versus your lesbian partners, like that's internalized biphobia, right? That's, that's a a level of biphobia. And that's, that's a big thing for me. Like I personally have like a, 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 a torch that I carry about biphobia in WLW fiction. Um, Mm -hmm. We have, a lot of biphobia in our genre that uh like I really kind of hate um thank you but uh but Mm. you know they are not neither of those characters in table for two are like I don't think they either of them express whether they are lesbian versus uh by pan but they have an std conversation and that's the kind of thing we need to normalize Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and that's one of the things that, that you do in shameless that, you know, kind of, or actually, I, I think it actually more carries over into not guilty because I don't think, I can't remember whether it comes up in both of them or just in not guilty, but the whole thing about Claire not liking the taste of latex. And that's why she takes the condom off. Not because she's like, oh, this barrier is a problem, yeah. but because like, oh, just latex tastes like <laughs> shit, which kind of, it does. Let's be honest. Yeah, right. Um, exactly. <laughs> you know, I didn't but know. like if you're having a random hookup, <laughs> you know, maybe you should use a condom. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that's what I've said. You know what? That brings me to an interesting question that I wanted to ask real quick oh, is that okay. Lily, so 
I love Lily as a character. Um, and I know, so, so I think I mentioned earlier, I can't remember if I mentioned earlier, that I read Shameless like halfway through reading Not Guilty because I wanted to go back and get that perspective. Mm -hmm. So I knew that the Lily in Not Guilty is the same Lily that's in Shameless. And she's a really interesting character. Like she's not a villain. She's not a bad guy, but you kind of root against her. And right. The, right. But, uh, you know, you talked about uh, in your BSB reading last night, um, you talked about how not guilty is the other side of shameless, but there's actually three sides of shameless because yeah. there's three people that have sex. So I want to know if there's going to be a Lily book soon <laughs> from Britt Ryder. You know, I don't know the answer to that. I hadn't really given, I had to like address the whole Lily thing. And I thought bringing her back in that guilty was a good idea because she just kind of appeared and you didn't really like her much in shameless. I think because she, she was kind of annoying. She's kind of like, oh, I gotta go. Let's you know do this and I'm and gonna so go fuck this chick. <laughs> right. And then so in not guilty when she shows up, you're just kind of like you know I I didn't want her to be more exciting to Emery or to the readers than Claire is. You know I needed that I needed their connection to stay you know tight and um, to have Lily. You know I just I I had to give her an outlet. I had to give her somewhere to go. So I don't know. I mean, I didn't really like her when I wrote her both times. You know, she just wasn't likable to me. And I did that on purpose. I needed somebody to to kind of still be interesting, but not enough to like really take, you know, one person away from the other person, uh, but just kind of be like a, um, like a, not really a play thing, but just kind of like an in-betweener. You know, she needed to be the in-betweener. So I don't know that she'll have a story because I didn't really connect with her as much as I did Emery mm -hmm. and Claire because the story for sure was trying to get them together. And like, like the first draft, like Clara was horrible. I had a beta reader, uh, she read it and she's like, yeah, I don't like Claire. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I, I don't like anything about Claire. So I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna have to try harder on this one. So the second round I went through and just, and tried to make her more likable because there are some people who are like Claire who are just strictly career driven. They don't care about anything, you know, it's, you know, they just, they have a need sexually to, and they need to fulfill it and they're not expecting love. And then all of a sudden love shows up. So it's, it's kind of like that's, that happens in real life. You know, there are some people who just like are all about sex, who don't really care about a relationship. And then when it shows up, they don't know how to, how to address it. They don't know what to do. And so that's this, this whole story is, is how to address this relationship. Is it real? Should I go for it? Should I not go for it? And um, I personally love Claire. I think she's great. I think she is somebody I would love to be in life. I mean, super career driven, super successful. She's you just want her loft. Let's be honest. That's you just want true. her and loft. I, I fucking love her loft. And I love the <laughs> garment district. And this is one of the few stories I've, I've written in the Kansas City area. Most of my stories aren't here. And I talk about everything. Like there's everything in that book is a true place in Kansas City. It was the first time I went off and just said, oh, I'm just going to write about Kansas City. So, and the garment district is beautiful. And I love the loft there. And I would love a place in the loft. I love that. So yeah, I went to be clear. See, and that's what, so I, I had a quote about Claire that I love. Oh, here it is. Okay. So this is Claire talking about her BFF. Jennifer fucking Matthews, lawyer extraordinaire, <laughs> sure uh, who is also awesome and pansexual, mm -hmm. so special place in my heart. Um, but so this is what Claire said. Uh, it was inevitable that one of us would fall in love. But truthfully, I always knew it would be her. I haven't opened my heart to anyone since college. And that was a tough lesson learned. I'm not going to lose my dream job to change diapers or wipe snotty noses because somebody I want, I love wants me to love isn't forever, but a career can be. And it's also rewarding. And I love like that quote is like Claire in a nutshell, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like she knows herself so well and she loves herself for who she mm -hmm. is. Like, uh, um, uh, so there's like the hint of a heartache, but the heartache doesn't define her. Like that doesn't even, like that's just a little bit in her past. Mm -hmm. So Emery mentions how she gives herself to pleasure. And that's a great thing about Claire. Like she really allows herself to feel pleasure, which is super rare, especially people who are socialized female, like who don't like 
embrace that. And so that's what I love about Claire is that she just, she knows herself. And like, Mm -hmm. let's be honest, like it's a story, like she's totally fucking wrong because that's (laughs) like- (laughs) Totally. (laughs) (laughs) But like, yeah, like that, just that idea of like a career can be forever, but love can't Mm -hmm. be. is like, that's her, her worldview. And I love that about her. Just I wish I knew more of her backstory, like like where she came from, why she was this driven, you know, like what made her want to put. I mean, lawyers are for the most part, they're very career driven, you know, obviously because you have to study a lot, you have to, you know, get your your law degree. And and I think it's kind of like she just went through all this and she found a way to get success fast. And you know, the here's a funny story. And So like my parents are not allowed to read my stuff ever. Like that is just an agreement we have. They just cannot read my stuff. And so my dad, when I was talking to my dad, my dad's a private investigator and he works for, uh, he does a lot of contract work for law, uh, for law firms. Right. And so my dad, my dad helped me with this book as far as getting, you know, the, like how they, how she could win a, like when I wrote Shameless, I wasn't thinking of writing like the whole other side from, uh, from Claire's point of view. So like, I really put myself in a bind by having her, you know, and then all of a sudden the next day she's a judge and Emery happens to be a witness on the case. I mean, that is a no, no, that is a absolute no, no in the law world. And so I was like, how am I going to get her out of this? You know, I I had already signed the contract with BSB. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to get her out of this? And so I talked to my dad. I'm like, dad, here's my situation. You know, here's what I have. And my dad's like, you can do it one of two ways. You can have it this way or this way. And so I'm like, okay. So my dad really like, he really got into this assignment. He was writing, like he would write a story and his character was Mary. And so Mary knew exactly like, like he wrote me this two page story of how Mary was able to get where she was and, and kind of in the same situation that, that Claire was in, but her name is Mary. And so my dad helped me with it. So I could never like thank him in my acknowledgements because who wants to do that in an erotica? Hey, thanks, Dad, <laughs> thanks, for your Steph. help. Did yeah. <laughs> Mary have sex in a museum? <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, but you know, I, I was kind of curious about how Claire is the way that she is. So I'm not, I don't know about her background. I don't, she never really told me, um, you know, where she came from or, or, or what her drive, where it came from. But there are people who are like that, you know, who are completely 100% career driven and that is their one goal in life and they want to make X amount of dollars. They want to be successful. They want all that until they don't, Mm -hmm. you know, and that was like kind of the story that that Claire hit, you know, she, she got everything she wanted and then she decided, you know, wow, really, you know, this is it. And so, yeah. Well, and that, and that's part of the, the beauty of like, when you achieve all of your girl, your goals so young, mm. oh, words are hard. Uh, when you achieve all of your goals so young, like Claire did, like, like what else is there to work for? You know, when you really believe like a career is forever and mm-hmm. it can be rewarding. And then like you're 35 and you get that. Right. Like, and she, she had like a ton of money. She got X amount of dollars from the lawsuit that her, her law firm, you know, that she managed to, to, to get, to win, you know, and then she's you know, got all this whiskey. whiskey. What happened to whiskey? What? She's got all, all that whiskey. whiskey? <laughs> she, does. Uh, she has whiskey, she has gin, all this wine, this local winery, which is funny because, you know, Ashley is my editor and she's like, okay, chill, relax she always calls me tiger and she's like relax tiger we get that missouri has wine you know because everybody's always <laughs> about napa valley or france or italy and stuff so you know we have a lot of wineries here in the midwest just because you know we have a lot of land a lot of grapes we have good weather for that and so uh, i was i was writing about how claire has a lot of wine and she's like settle down we don't need to go into details about how much wine claire has or <laughs> nobody cares so yeah but yes yeah, well, she's yeah. uh, so you mentioned that like a lot of the like restaurants and stuff that you used are real, right? They are. Because I did the same real. thing. Like, like okay, so the, the source, uh, the first like tragically bad date that Kieran goes on and swipe right uh, <laughs> is at the source, which is a Wolfgang Peck Puck restaurant in oh. D.C. Well, it was COVID. Fuck you, COVID. <laughs> um <laughs> But like, that was where my wife always wanted to go every year for her birthday. So we would go there every year. 
so like the great part is like i'm like hey baby it's research we got to go to the source <laughs> <laughs> i need to know yeah. what their seasonal menu is right <laughs> um, but uh yeah like i think that it adds a little bit of fun um so i won a gold league a couple years back for a burn on the wire and like 90 percent of the places i mentioned in that are mm -hmm. real because I feel like it adds something when you as the author mm -hmm. can sit in the booth in the restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. When you can like drink the wine, know what it, like, it just feels, you get, you get that feeling, you know, when an author is like talking about a real place, right? Right. Exactly. For, good sure. for the reader too, especially right. if it's a place that doesn't show up very often. I live in Calgary and I don't know if either of you know, Alyssa Lynn Palmer at all. Uh, she's mm -hmm. a bold strokes author and you would she, think I would know <laughs> Chris you're the one no I'm kidding um so she last year released a book uh through bold strokes called uh city kitty and country mouse which was oh adorable. yeah yeah I saw that one yeah it's adorable and it's set in Calgary and at the farmer's market and I was so thrilled because I never get to read romances that are set here it's so like, it's just, it's special. Well, we, I think we both did that, right? Like both of like, so I, uh, I actually, it's funny. So I moved for my job in 2018. When I wrote this book, I was planning on moving to Woodbridge, which is right outside of DC. Um, and then I found out that it was ridiculously expensive. So we ended up having to go to where I could afford, which was Culpepper. And that, ends up as a like kind of a fun storyline in the book um but I have this book is actually I'm writing a series like so like I'm working on the second book now uh which is Marlene who is in Swipe Right um she gets the second book and Abby the bartender um yeah, but, I like her yeah Abby is fantastic uh and I, I love her and I wanted her to be happy and so I wrote a book for her um, but, and your book is set in Kansas city and there's a lot of stuff that's local. Like, I feel like there's a different, when you write about your own, like your backyard, right. It feels, somebody said, I feel like it was Mark Twain or something said like, write what you know. Right. And there is something real about that. There's something when you like can sit in the booth next to your character mm -hmm. and like feel that moment, it comes across on the page, right? I think that's true. I mean, and I did this. I went to a culinary school for taste and I loved writing that because I had that experience, you know, and I was so excited to write it. And I think that when you, when you know a place and you visited it and it's just, it's a part of your world, it for sure adds to the story. You know, and this is the, like I wrote shameless in 2017 and then I didn't write about Kansas city again until not guilty. So it's not, I don't write about Kansas city and I don't know why I don't, you know, there are very successful authors who write about, you know, their own hometown and, and write about it all the time. And it's just like, I don't know, I just feel like, like, I don't know, I, just, I feel like there's so much out there in the world. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go write about this character from South Africa and like, she'll have an accent. And like, so I write about all these, these places that I've never been, but I want to. And I feel like I'm not doing myself justice by not writing about what I know. And so I feel like this, for not writing, not guilty, I did that. I, I just said, you know, we're going to write about it here. It's going to take place here. And the people who are from here will appreciate it. And hopefully the people who aren't from here will catch that I really enjoy where I live. And it's a big part of my story. Maybe you should write us all a Missouri winery book. <laughs> I know I should. It's probably really, really bad wine because I don't drink wine. So I don't know if it's good or not. <laughs> So it's probably really bad, but I'm going to write about it. Good point. I feel like this is a way that we can merge. I love wine. So like we I'll just get together. Wine. We drink a fuck ton. Uh, <laughs> oh, wait, we already did that. <laughs> I love this idea. We should totally do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, any final thoughts that either of you want to share before we wrap this up? One of the things. Mind. Yes, I have final thoughts. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention that we kind of talked about during part of my my uh, not guilty part portion was that uh, pansexual, like the main character is pansexual. Yes. And I love that. I mean, that like that, like for me and Tara, that's our that makes our queer hearts happy, you know, to to read that because we don't see that a lot. 
you know, especially not in my, in my writing world, you know, because I do write romance and I don't see it a lot. It's pretty much lesbian, lesbian. And so to see a pansexual and to read about a pansexual is just as enjoyable as, you know, ever. I grew up on straight romance and hetero, you know, male, female romance. And so uh, it didn't bother me at all. I loved seeing like the, the diversity of the character. And, and I think that's so important because everybody's on the spectrum. And I think a lot of it, you know, especially up and coming, you know, like Tara was saying about baby queers. I mean, they need to see themselves in books. And I think there's so much coming up where it's, I can be right in the middle, you know, and, and I feel like to see, they can see themselves in your books. And I love that. And I think that's great for, for, for queers everywhere. So good job. Thank you. Yeah. I had a comment about that, that we both had pansexual characters, like for, for me. So it was your, Jen was, was a side character, but she was, uh, was pan. I, so like, I feel like I need to explain because I am a lesbian. I'm a cis white lesbian. Right. And I write about a lot of very diverse characters. Right. Uh, and part of that is like, so my wife is bi mm -hmm. and she didn't tell me that she was bi until many years in our, into our relationship. Um, and I think part of that was that she was worried how I would react. Right. Oh, and really? so, yeah, like, so we were together, I think we were together like almost 10 years before she was like, Hey, I'm bi. And like, and I will admit I was that, that lesbian woman who was like, Oh, like I, I turned her, you know what I mean? Like my <laughs> wife had always dated like men before and like, uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> good for you good job <laughs> like I'm a I'm a 90s lesbian so it's like you know I grew up with like all the horror stories of like Anne Hayes is gonna do this to you right oh yeah oh yeah and uh and so for me like I have this huge like I have this chip on my shoulder where I like it's my my biggest thing is to write characters who aren't straight and aren't lesbians mm -hmm. and show that like they're human people, right? I, right. I, that's one of the things that I loved about Kieran is like, she was really burned by her husband. Like, a, this is, kind of comes up late in the book, but like, uh, Kieran uh, married her high school sweetheart and was completely in love with him. Like, everything was great. And then she realized that she wasn't quite straight and she told him and he completely betrayed her. Mm -hmm. And that ended up really like marring her as a human and I, I don't, I write those characters because I don't want that to happen to actual people. Right. Um, you know, like I, I, I think about the fact that it took so long for my wife to confide in me. We've been, we've been married for 20, we've been together for 20 years. Right. So like, uh, it took so long for her to confide in me that like, this is how she felt because she was worried that like, I wouldn't take it well. And the fact that she didn't like know that I would take it well, like I, I don't want anyone to feel that way, right? right? I mean, I think that like like Terry, you talked very um, very honestly about the wonderful uh, way that like you had your coming out, mm -hmm. and I want every bi and pan woman to have that moment. So like I want to like just really normalize that that coming out as bi or pan is not. It doesn't change anything about you. And it makes you just an amazing, like another facet of how amazing you are as a human being. So like, that's one of the things I wanted to write about here. Yeah, and I've talked a lot, sorry. Beautifully said, yeah. I agree. I mean, I 100% agree because, you know, I think people get stuck on labels so much. You know, and I, I was on a panel not too long ago about butch versus femme, you know, and, and like, like how people are kind of getting away from that label and that label has only been around for X amount of years, you know? And so people are like, they're not comfortable with that. And I totally get it. I get it that people don't want labels and, and, and I get that you can love anybody you want and you can fall in love with whether it's a man or a woman or, you know, however they identify. And I think it's, you just love people. People just love people, you know, it's, it's like what's in their right. heart. And I think that's important to tell, you know, it just, it, I tend to lean obviously more towards women, um, but not everybody does. And I'm not going to like say, oh, that's wrong. Or you can't feel that way. I think that's so wrong in, in, in our, especially in, in queer literature, you, you talk about what's important and, and that love is love and you promote that. And so I'm, I'm like, 
I'm, I'm extending how I feel about things and putting it in my books and I'm writing pansexual characters and I'm writing non-binary characters. And I think that's important just for the growth of, of LGBTQ um, literature. And, and you're writing, you wrote a pansexual character who ended up with a man. And that is like, and he's a great dude. Like, honestly, Orlando Bloom. I know. <laughs> like, he's a great dude. Uh, so like, <laughs> and, and showing that uh, is really beautiful and really important. Uh, and, I, and I'm excited to see the way that our genre as WLW fiction and WLW romance, specifically in Erotica, kind of merges with just queer fiction yeah you know I agree um I I think that that's an exciting place for us to go and I don't think people understand how important it is to have this really positive um representation because when I started reading in this uh about nine or ten years ago almost all by representation was negative it mm-hmm. was the it was like the evil ex who couldn't decide or the, like it it was all stereotypes and so it was as someone who came to understand my bisexuality and queerness through fiction it was this weird like is this going to be a triggering book or is it going to be a good book and now it's like i don't feel like i have to worry about that anymore so it's really I feel like it's really exciting and heartening. I mean, unfortunately, um, seeing some of the takes on books on Twitter sometimes can still um, be triggering. And also, unfortunately, as a person who's tweeting out reviews all the time, um, people love to tell me when um, they have thoughts right. <laughs> about stuff like this. But, you know, the mute function is... A beautiful thing right. can be used liberally when you want to so. right, right. yeah that, that's one of those things uh you know uh, Melissa Braden talked not too long ago about having some really negative yeah. feedback about the fact that she even writes in WLW fiction because she is a you know a bi woman married to a man and like honestly like Melissa Braden like is probably like 30% to 40% of our genre, right? Like she writes amazing work. And if you haven't read any Melissa Braden, it's like, it's like saying you read W.O.W., but you haven't read Radcliffe. Like what the fuck? (laughs) And once every year to year and a half, I'll see a review pop up somewhere like Amazon Goodreads, something like that. Or it'll be like a comment on an Instagram post or something. But like, I'll see something about somebody. and, And it's like, they feel like they're exposing the fact that she has a husband. And I'm like, motherfucker, where have you been? <laughs> right? She right? named them in her books. <laughs> like, right. what are yeah. you doing? You've exposed nothing. nothing. Everybody <laughs> knows. This is no secret. Have you read the books? They are quality. What does he have to do with it? He's not writing the books. What do you care? Come on. Yeah. And like some of those, like, I, I don't know. Like I'm in, I'm in this place. Like I said, I, it's a, it's a huge it's a huge thing for me because I like, I feel like I'm like current carrying a sword and a shield for my wife, you know? So like, it's like a big deal for me, but like, like dudes like Neil and like Melissa Braden's uh, husband, like, like those are the dudes that like Mm -hmm. should be celebrated in our, in our uh, genre, like Orlando Bloom. What's his, what's Orlando Thomas, is that was what his real name was? His last name. I just remember that she compared him to Orlando Bloom all the time. Whatever Jen fucking Matthews, Laura Extraordinaire's <laughs> uh, partner is, like, like those are dudes that I want to like really highlight. And I and and I feel like there are those men out there. Like, you know, I don't want to be like that that lesbian who's like, not all men. Um, but like, not all men, you know, like. Right. And and not all lesbians, not all not all bisexual women, not all pansexual women. Like I just I think that uh, one of the things that are, is great in both of these stories is like celebrating the full spectrum of sexuality. Yes. Um, and I think it's, so, it's good that we we actually tackled that because I think a lot of people shy away because they don't want any negativity in their books. You're like, Oh, I can't talk about, you know, bisexual character because like X amount of reviewers are going to hate it. 
you know, or exactly. I can't talk about a man ending up with a man because, you know, I mean, we've had situations where like that is like, oh, I can't read that. No way. If somebody ends up with a man, oh, oh. you know, and that's a like, yep. true life. Like, like life happens and, and sometimes you end up with a, a man, sometimes you end up with a woman and, you know, it just, it's, it's your life and your choices. And we need to show that on the page. And I think that we both kind of showed that. I think we did that, you know, like, Hey, I hope so. Like, I, I hope that like that, uh, buy and pan women read our books and feel seen because yeah. like, look, I read Emery and I was like, Hey, she likes to wear a dildo. I feel seen. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, 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 to get this. Uh, like, take it. if people <laughs> find you online, where can they connect with you? Not uh, in a museum. I'm married <laughs> happily. <laughs> online, if they would like to follow you. No, uh, so I'm much more active on Twitter uh, at Tegan Shepherd, uh, and uh, and I am on twi- on Facebook sometimes. Uh, right. But yeah, or Instagram. I, I don't Instagram. No, I, I don't like, look, I I'm so I feel so old. Uh, like I have this friend who sends me TikToks all the time. I'm like, what is a talk? Don't yeah. take me. Yeah, see, if it's not good, it'll end up on Twitter. Uh, Chris, right exactly Chris, Chris I feel like as this is your Patreon everybody probably already knows how to find you but right. the rare chance that somebody uh, somehow got drunk and stumbled their way over here and doesn't know how to find you anywhere right. else do you want to share how to connect? Uh, let's see chrisbryant.net uh, chrisbryantbooks at gmail.com chrisbryant2014 on Twitter and I don't even know my Instagram because I don't post pictures of myself is my dog and of course i have the, the podcast with tara clearly recommended.com yes which is fantastic thank you all right this has been a blast thank yes. you so much Megan, for showing up this is fantastic. absolutely it's thanks fun. for having me and let me drink in public oh right. great I'm we'll do gonna, this soon hopefully i'm not gonna stop recording yet because neil asked me to try to get you to do something while i was recording which you can cut oh before you post this live huh. are you drunk enough to do your southern or english accents oh i see usually so okay so i am from virginia like i am southern chris is laughing oh. she knows that oh, i was at southernness <laughs> no chris, in the last episode mm-hmm. as we were editing stuff out chris said that she had to be drunk to do accents but that she has good accents you know what it was funny like one day i like all day i was speaking with a british accent and deb's like what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> i just have so much fun doing it but no i don't think i'm drunk enough to do that yet i think it needs to be i, I need to catch me early catch me early <laughs>